Good day, everyone. I hope we are all adjusting well with the new way of life. I am sure that to some, it is not so difficult, really, to navigate through. I also assume that to some people, it is quite difficult to navigate what we are experiencing right now. I also uh, have some difficulties in this new situation, but through the unchanging kindness and Christian life of our brothers and our sisters and you, brothers and sisters, as well as through our checking and praying and encouraging one another, the situation is actually livable. Our family, my family, and wife and children we're praying for, for some of you whom the Lord brings to mind. Our small family prays together every night for each of your names that the Lord will bring into our minds. We enjoy doing it. It's fun to review um, answered prayers and rejoice with those who receive the answers as well as you report. It gives us pleasure also to know that our Lord is the same ancient God in this new normal. I'd like to address the reality of the new normal. I would lead you to the Word of God so that we can transcend from our smaller and unique individual experiences into an overview of what is happening to us and in us and through us. A very similar biblical narrative says so much about our time and our experiences. In it, they found that when God's people remain as God's people that they are, the new normal becomes an avenue in shaping and leading the future generation to the person of our God. Let me repeat that. In this particular passage of Scripture, I found that when God's people remain as God's people that they are, the new normal becomes an avenue in shaping and leading the future generation of the pers to the person of God. I have entitled this message, Living the New Normal. Whether we like it or not, consciously or unconsciously, our world changes. Change is comfortable when we are the ones causing the change. But change becomes uncomfortable when change is forced upon us. For example, when you migrate to another country, you will be filled with excitement regardless of how the new country forces you to live like the rest in that country. And so even if you're a foreigner, if you are new to the country, it's okay. But when you are kidnapped, and forced to live in a place that is totally different from where you come from. And then you begin to do some routines that were forced into you and protocols that are foreign to you. Change becomes very uncomfortable. You see, there are two ways for change to happen. One is you cause the change. And the second one is you are forced to change. The latter makes you feel violated and cause you to react by preserving yourself. I'm going to defend myself because of this change or react so violently that will make your transition very, very difficult. Daniel, in our text, and the other youth, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were from Jerusalem and they experienced the latter part of change. They were kidnapped. And they were forced to live in the new normal, the lifestyle of Babylon. They seem to live wisely, though, as they navigate the life in this new normal that they're living now. But how did they live in the new normal? Could we learn some wisdom out of their experience? I am sure we will. Because if the book of Daniel is useless to us, God's people in the present time, the story of Daniel may not actually have been preserved. Maybe, perhaps, but now that we are reading it, there must be something in it that God wanted us to learn today. 
So let us see the narrative. What happened in the life of Daniel? Well, number one is this. That there was a changing reality in their life. There was a new enemy, and the new enemy besieged them. Did you notice the Bucanis are doing that to the city of Jerusalem? There was an enemy who attacked and sieged Jerusalem, and a pagan king, the Bucanis are confined Jerusalem and trapped Jerusalem, and he besieged it and took whatever interested him, and then besieged these and put them in the bag and put them into his own city. The word for besiege is the Hebrew word tour, meaning to bind or to confine or to shut or to shut off or maybe to enclose into something. That's the idea of being besieged. It's like putting a place in prison. To understand better, the Old Testament uses some more of these words in a different sense. And by going through that, we will be able to understand what are included in besieging. Well, the first of the um, words that used in the, New, in the Old Testament is in Judges chapter 9, verse 31. And it reads like this. And he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly, saying, Behold, Gaal, the son of Ebed and his relatives, have come to Shechem, and they are stirring up the city against you. The word besieged in this, in this text of the scripture is the word stirring up, tzor in uh, Hebrew. And the idea is this. This word is used to seeds uh, and it produces an idea of chaos. You know, and we're stirring up all the people and this results to the, ne the next word, which is found in 2 Kings chapter 12, verse 10. The word is bagged and counted the money for commercial purposes. The verse says something like this, And whenever they saw that there was much money in the chest, the king's secretary and the high priest came up, and they bagged and counted the money that was found in the house of the Lord. The word bag, or putting into a bag, or to enclose the money into a bag, is actually the same as the word besiege, meaning to say it is harvesting something, enclosing it into a bag, and bringing it away so that he can make business or he can make profit out of it. It's like looting. So the word besiege is also used to picture an image of economic and commercial harvest, such as the verse suggests. This also suggests that it affects the economy and the one who does, who does it loots the city. The money bag, he brings it out and make money out of it. The third word gives us a different idea. Second Chronicles chapter 28, verse 20 reads something like this. So Tiglath Pileser, the king of Assyria, came against him and afflicted him. Notice that word, afflicted. Is the same word, actually, that was used when Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem. So, and besieged him instead of strengthening him. So the idea, this particular translation, gives us a picture of affliction and pain and suffering. Does that, does that sound familiar to you? So meaning to say being besieged means you would feel pain, afflictions, and suffering. In Psalms chapter 139, verse 5, we find the next word. The word is hem, and, and the idea is like a seamstress, the one that makes curtain or sew them. It reads something like this. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Now, this is, pra uh, uh, this is maybe um, talking about the psalmist that, that describes how God had entrapped him into the secure part of hemming. And it also suggests the action of pushing and keeping in one corner so that it's safe or so that it is trapped. And this term is used in sewing of the uh, curtains of the temple. The last word that um, means the same is that 
seeds were or fortress. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 3. And I will encamp against you all around and will besiege you with towers and I will raise seeds works against you. The idea of siege works here is the idea of sewer, meaning to say when someone besieges you, you are put in the middle of all the towers and all the fences. And this verse suggests that a tall tower or fence surrounds so that no one can get out. Now, gather all of these ideas. All of these ideas and images are present in the word besieged. Imagine the reality of life of the people of Jerusalem, specifically Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that was inflicted when Nebuchadnezzar sieged Jerusalem. Now, this, is, uh, this reality um, move on to a new place. Well, we come to the second one. Things were changing, and there was a changing reality. And part of this reality also is that a new place. Remember, they come from Jerusalem, and the word Jerusalem or the name Jerusalem means teaching of peace. Their previous city that teaches peace and looks forward to its absolute fulfillment have now become a different place that is called the place between two rivers. And uh, I wonder how confusing that is. Which of the rivers should I go to? Which of the rivers should I swim into? And this is the very idea of the city where they were brought into, the land of Shinar. And the idea of land of Shinar is a country of two rivers. Now, this is actually part in Babylon, a very pagan nation. In this nation, there's a multiple god system. And somewhere around the, the, the plain of Shinar, Remember, a tower was built there, and that's the Tower of Babel. Men in this particular land attempted so proud an ambition so that they could reach heaven. The Tower of Babel, where, as you know in the story, that was it. It was on this part of Shinar. It was maybe in the surrounding part of this land. And God caused them confusion to stop their anti-God ambition. Now you see from Jerusalem to Shinar, there was a new place. There was a change place for them. Another reality that changed is that there's a new victim. Now you see, I was thinking, I was so interested, why would God allow his faithful, most wise men to be brought into this land of confusion? Shinar, where Tower Babel was frustrated by God. But the victims were youth, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were victims. They were faithful, they were godly, they were the choice. They were well-trained, young people, and, and, and they were forced into this new normal. They were kidnapped. They were led into this fold, and they were brought into this new, um, new place. They were the victims. Another reality that changed is that their diet changed too. Now notice very carefully, there was a changed diet. If you have your Bibles with you, read verse 5. I hope you are following me in your scripture as I speak here. Um, look at this new diet. They were treated well, but in the standard of the new world, in the standard of the new normal. I chuckled at the thought that they were introduced to a new diet, and I named the new diet for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Babylonian kingly diet. Well, this seems different though in our situation. Our diet right now are probably only the essentials and simple food. Restaurants are closed. Crispy pata becomes only a dream. The puchero is so dry. It's hard to find. I think Many will wish to be in the place of Daniel with the Babylonian kingly menu. That sounds like a good arrangement. A new diet, kingly diet. Our diet, though, are quite restricted nowadays to vegetables and fish. Well, I'm not really sure about your diet. Perhaps you have better food, but I just try to imagine with all the scarcity of income right now, maybe you two are moving into a um, restricted diet at the same time so that there will be no wasted and only those that are available in the market you will get. Though we praise the Lord for 
in our case, the Lord delivers special food to us every week. And uh, my family enjoys that and they're very, very grateful and enjoy the weekly treats. Whew, God is good. And if you are watching right now, and if you are the one who had sent us food, thank you very much. Thank you very much for doing that to us. That's, that's a source of encouragement for us. And when we think about this, I can think of we're not alone. I thank you who send up special food every week, as well as some allowances when we needed it the most. Thank you very much for your ministry with us. Another change of reality that changed in the life of Daniel is that of education. Well, of course, almost every school right now has a changed way of education. Everyone goes online. We too goes online. But there was this new education in Daniel's life. Read your verse 5 or just follow me through the text. But this time their education was in the ways of Babylon. You know, another reality, a new learning in the new normal. The philosophies of Babylon they're learning. The new normal or Babylonian normal. Some of them are good information. Some of them are bad information. Some are useless, but some could be useful as well. These are the learning that may affect them negatively, as well as those learning that may benefit them in the future. A change of education. There was also a change of purpose. So you see, reality is really changing around Daniel here, and now he has a new purpose, which is to help and serve the king. This besieging puts them into a new role, and that is to help a pagan human king. Quite an irony, isn't it? When godly people were forced or called to work in a confused government, it is an irony. Sometimes you would wonder why God put you there. But somehow it happened in the Bible. Maybe it's happening now too, that some of the faithful people of God found in the church are now ushered into the government agencies so that God's purpose might stand. There must be a plan of God for them in the midst of all this. You see, the situation of Daniel's time is really not that different from ours, really not that different. Something has ruled us and imprisoned us all. And it created affliction and fears amidst our people. It changes our lifestyle as we are forced to follow weird rules. And yes, you and I, all Christians and believers, are affected by this. There is a lot of new learnings, both lies and true. Many beliefs are formed. And this leads us into a huge and massive state of confusion. You know, this pandemic has introduced a new normal. And, and, and many are having a hard time navigating through this. It is difficult. But how did Daniel and how did his three friends live in the new normal? Let's look at the person in this narrative. Rather, let's look at the persons in this narrative. First, we have or we find the unchanging person of Daniel, even if the reality around him change. What did we find? We find the unchanging person of Daniel, even when his reality change. You know, for Daniel, even in the new normal, it does not change his ancient godly values. So let's go into him and try to look what had happened to Daniel so that we know how he lived in the new normal. First thing first, he was one of those unchanging persons. And we find in here, verse 8 reads, And when you think about this, you can say that there was an ancient godly value for Daniel to stay even if things changes differently. Verse 8 reads, 
Look at your Bible there, please, and, and, and read with me. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Now, I can think of two possible reasons why, why Daniel resolved not to defile himself, you know, of the king's food. Well, this is a good thing. Maybe Daniel has some kind of belief while he was back in Jerusalem, and uh, his, his values are already set. There's something in the food of uh, Babylon, Babylonian Empire, that may defile Daniel. And so I kind of think and think of two possible reasons why Daniel resolved not to defy himself with the food. First reason is this. This is only what I think. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not true, maybe it is, but the Bible did not seem to explain, though, why he uh, thought that he would be defiled by the king's food. Well, number one is this. The food was sacrificed to the God of the Babylonians. Now, you can get an idea when you read the name of the king, Nebuchadnezzar. And this is the food of Nebuchadnezzar. And you know, if you chop, chop his name, you will find who the God of Nebuchadnezzar is. The God of Nebuchadnezzar is the God Nebu. N-E-B-U, or sometimes it is spelled differently, Nabu, N-A-B-B-U. You can go to uh, you know, Google and try to search on that one. There's a lot of, of biblical dictionaries right there. But this god Nebo, he was the god of literacy. He was the god of rational arts. He was the god of scribes and wisdom. This was the God of Nebuchadnezzar. Did you wonder why? The very first thing that he did when he captured Daniel and the three friends is he put them right away into his school. Literacy, education. In, the, in, um, in Babylon, you will find a giant slogan. You know what the giant slogan would say? It would say something like this. Edukasyon ang solusyon. Does that sound familiar with our system here? Well, there was a time, there was actually a year that DepEd had pushed this particular slogan, Edukasyon ang solusyon. You know, in Babylon, education is being worshipped. The learned is being held highly. And Babylonian, the Babylonian kingdom is hard and worshippers of the wise. The wise people there could be just like gods. So this is the first um, the first. Thing that I found because the food offered to them could have been offered to God Nebo so that God Nebo will bless the food and then the food will make the eater wise. I wonder how many food Nebuchadnezzar had eaten, blessed by Nebu, but I was just wondering why he cannot interpret his own dream. But the second reason is this. Maybe the food is badly processed. You know, this is another reason I could think. The food preparation in the culture and practice of Babylonian could be hygienic when Daniel is going to assess it. Maybe they do not prepare, you know, the food and the meat better. And maybe Daniel know that ahead, even when he was in Jerusalem and trying to learn all of the Babylonian empires by their own uh, rabbi. He probably knew this food processing practice of the Babylonian back in Jerusalem. So he did not want to defile himself. One reason could be because it's the food of God Nebo, which is not a true God. Second, maybe the food is quite dirty. But you know what? I try to think this way. This is quite really a commitment. The pleasure of a kingly menu and diet versus the risking and endangering the godly value and personal health, Daniel resolved not to be defiled by it. Let me repeat that. The pleasure of a kingly menu and diet versus taking and in versus risking and endangering the godly value and personal health, Daniel resolved not to defy himself with it. That is such a huge commitment. He did not change when it comes to his values. You know, in the age of food abundance, oftentimes we reward ourselves too much. 
indulgence is the word. And when you go around when, when the world was not yet in a pandemic, you will find eat all you can anywhere. And it's fun to go into an eat all you can restaurant, but you will also see how indulgent we are and people have become when it comes to food. That we don't care about the effect of food and drinks or godly values as well as our physical bodies anymore. As long as we can eat and as long as we can be happy there. But Daniel was committed not to destroy himself with the food that the king ate. Daniel was committed not to destroy his value, his godly value, by not taking the food sacrificed to Nebu. Number two here is that we find in this unchanging person, Daniel, is that he had the courage to ask permission from the chief eunuch. Now, the eunuch said, we are going to give you this food. And Daniel said, oh, please, no, please don't. Can you just give us vegetables rather and plain water so that, you know, we, we, can, uh, we can eat? We don't want to defile that, uh, our bodies with it. And um, he had the courage. And I guess he was tactful in speaking to the chief eunuch, the one in charge of the food services. If he could only eat vegetables and only drink plain water, I think the issue here is this. Daniel knows how to communicate tactfully, persuasively, and knows how to present his needs to the authorities. He did not rally against the food. He did not bash the chief eunuch because he did not like the food. He did not make up false stories about him, but he bravely, tactfully requested and presented what he needs. By doing this, he was able to see the inside heart of the chief eunuch, and then he discovered that he too was scared. Now, how do we react to some restrictions? Let's say it's so hard to eat anymore, we can't go to the market, we can go to here and that. Do we bash the government because of that? Daniel was courageous, but he was doing it with tact as well. Then he learned that the eunuch as well was afraid of his life. You know, when one person opens up to you about his fears, it is an opportunity to minister to the person. Oftentimes, I find it very, very true in my ministry by talking to people through their fears. And that where we can infuse courage and a sense of we are one in this together. We back you up and we will always bring your name and situation to God when we pray. A new normal, listen to this, a new normal can induce all kinds of fear and uncertainty in, the, in every human heart. But, this, but it is the same opportunity to also take courage and minister to others who have no hope in Christ. Let me repeat that sentence. I like this very much. This new normal can induce all kinds of fear and uncertainty in your heart. But it is the same opportunity so that we take courage and minister to those others who have no hope in Christ. One thing that also was good at Daniel is that he submitted to the judgment of the chief eunuch. He said, you know, sir, Test us 10 days with vegetables and water alone. And then after 10 days, compare us to those, to the other youth that eat, you know, the king's daily food. So Daniel and friends agreed to submit themselves. They said, okay, we will submit to you. Test us, evaluate us, judge us, you know, after 10 days. When we think about this, about how Daniel had done this, and then think about his background. Daniel was already very much educated in Jerusalem. And probably he knew things about this. But yet he was so humbled enough to persuade the chief to evaluate them and judge them after 10 days. To submit to a new human chief assigned over him. This shows how humble Daniel was. Humility is very, very important in a situation, in a tense situation like this. You know, the new normal indeed demands our humility as well. Before 
the whoever authorities are set before us. Maybe they are the, the, the uh, checkpoint policemen and army men there. Or maybe they are the, the LGU leaders there. Doesn't matter. They are the ones who are set to guide us above us. And we need to be submissive to them. And guess what? Even if we thought that the person of that the person who is set above us is lesser in knowledge than us. The chief eunuch may probably have not known that you could be healthy with vegetables and water. But Daniel could have known that if he is going to get sick with the king's food, he's not going to be the best body ever in the kingdom among all the kidnaps. And Daniel knew that, but Daniel submitted to the chief eunuch who didn't know that. You know, violation of the value of the godly value of submission can put us in a position of danger. Being insubmissive, or if we do not submit to the authorities set before us or set on top of us, we can be in danger in this pandemic. I don't know if you had tracked an issue. It's actually a very similar issue. It erupted in Facebook between a medical doctor and the governor over the issue of uh, steam inhalation. To op <laughs> I know you, 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 you might have discovered that as well. It's a very familiar incident, but I will not go into the details. You probably know better than myself because I don't follow... I really don't follow stories like that. That's the life of another people, and it doesn't concern uh, me. Um, so I would not go into details. But rather, um, there was a threat to drag the case to court. Now, I did not make any follow-up to that. But in that point alone, I don't really know what happened after it. But I think... That simply puts someone in danger because he was not tactful enough and probably got wild in, in, in the comments against someone who was put on authority on this time of pandemic. I think this could happen if we lose our tact. And in terms of communicating with the leaders set above us in this pandemic, what I found in Daniel is that Daniel lived a humble and tactful, submissive life in the new normal. A humble, tactful, submissive life in the new normal. He also lived in courage to face what was to come. And he resolved to remain pure and true to his ancient godly values as he lived in a new normal. You know what, in this new normal, this would bring a lot of new things, a lot of new changes. But if there is one thing that is not going to change, it is the spiritual value. It is the godly value. It is the Christian value that are very, very much biblical that should not change in us. It did not change in Daniel, even if his environment had changed. Daniel, the wise, the resolve, the courageous, the tactful, submissive person remained and changed in a changing world. Could that happen to us? Could we remain unchanging in a changing world? That's the first unchanging person. The second one is found in, the, in verse 9. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. You know, we see that the God of Daniel interacting in the new normal. He is the God who is always participating in life. He worked behind the scene. And God caused the eunuch to favor Daniel. This is a miracle here, you know. In the text, we learn that the chief eunuch was scared for his life. 
Look at verse 10. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my Lord King who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in worse condition than all the other youths around who are of your own age? So he would endanger my head and the king. And he responded, verse 14, jump to verse 14. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. You know, the ancient God of Daniel was participating in the new normal of Daniel. He is the God of every day. Touches, you know, it, it touches us to be patient and and, and touches others to give us favor as well. When God moves, He makes other people favor us. When God moves, some people can even sacrifice themselves for the sake of God's people. When the ancient God moved in the new normal, the chief eunuch gave favor to Daniel at the cost of his head, his own life. Can you see that? Isn't it a huge, miraculous favor? It is only possible when God works in our new normal. Can you imagine what happened? Daniel is going to cut my head if I'm not going to give you the food. If you're not going to eat, he's going to kill me. And when Daniel explained and explained and explained, and he said, okay, Daniel, I believe you. I favor you. Go ahead even if it cost my neck. That's a miracle to me. That's huge. You know, this ancient God, equipped with Daniel wisdom and understanding, while he lived in the new normal, verse 17 and 18 can be summarized by saying, God gave wisdom and learning. You know, if there is one thing that is a huge struggle for every person who is forced to live in a new normal, it is the uncertainty of the times and the future. Many had actually mentally collapsed along the way, overthinking how to navigate and how to navigate life now, and especially this unchartered territory and unchartered time. Hey, brother, sister, if you are listening right there, I'd like to remind you, God is with us. God is with me. God is with you. God is with us. He is the unchanging person. He lived with Daniel in his new normal. He lives with us too in our new normal. Trust Him on that. He is our God who does not change even when things changes around us. He is the God who remains forever faithful even when our world is unfaithful to us. Here is another result coming from the unchanging God. The favor continued and Daniel become very, very smart and wise, 10 times better than the rest. The scripture told us at the end of time, this is verse 18 now, at the end of time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in order in before Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 19, And the king spoke with them, and among all of them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and all the enchanters that were in all his kingdom. Wow! What can I say? What can you say about that? Ten times better. He honored his values. He remained a, a faithful believer of God, even in the changing, most challenging times. Ten times better. You know, God lived with them in this new normal. And as they live with unchanging faith and values of remaining pure, rather, as they live with an unchanging faith and values and remaining pure before God, 
they developed the courage and the peaceful submission. They were honored with ten times wiser than anyone else in the kingdom. This is just a side note, which I would include in the later part of my sermon. This is a part of the series again. When you continue really reading the following chapters in the book of Daniel, you'll be surprised. Because when you continue reading, you will find out that it was not only ten times wiser. He was ten times promoted. He became ten times more influential. And he became ten times more prosperous. Ten times more blessed. But, you know, it can wait for the next sermon, next month. But what does this mean to us? Is living the new normal an avenue to remain and change in our faithfulness to God and the godly biblical values? The answer is yes. Will we come out wiser from this new normal? The answer is yes. Will it develop tactfulness, courage to speak our situation in a proper way? Yes, we will learn. Will it be an opportunity to minister to others who are gripped by fear? Yes, this is the opportunity. You know, living in the new normal could be a training ground for this generation to be more committed, more tempered, more tactful, more courageous, more wise, godly people. But you may ask, why are we trained in this new normal? It's what for? Has God a purpose for the new normal? Let's find out. Go to the last verse of chapter 1. Read with me. Verse 21 says, And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now look at this. Look at the long-lasting impact to the new world. Daniel was promoted and lived past how many kings? King Nebuchadnezzar, King Belshazzar, King Darius, King Cyrus. He outlived four kings. How old, how many years could Daniel have helped the kingdom of Babylon? You see, imagine the blessing to the next ruler. Imagine the blessing and imagine how God is glorified in among the paganistic nations. Imagine how God took the center stage of the political arena and the, and, and the uh, king's decree and the kingdom's decree from Nebuchadnezzar to his son Belshazzar to King Darius the Medes and to Cyrus of Persia. Daniel lived through them. Daniel became the wisest advisor of all times. He lived the new normal and came out conquering four kings. And he displayed God's glory in these kingdoms throughout these years. So how to live in the new normal in this pandemic? Well, we need to resolve to remain pure to our godly and biblical Christian values. One, develop a lifestyle of cleanliness and holiness, resolve to not be defiled by ungodly values. Two, develop the courage to express your wants and needs in a tactful, respectful way. Three, learn to submit rather than bash the leaders appointed above us at this moment of time. You know what? God can work these things through as He shapes the future for Himself by shaping us through this life in the new normal. God has something far ahead in the future that needed us to be trained right now because you and I plays a more important role in the new world where He is leading us into. May God bless you and me. May God bless us all as we live in the new normal today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for allowing us to dive in the life of Daniel chapter 1 
and allow us to see how he entered into the scene and created a long impact to the world. And that even puts your name into the king's decree and commanded all the people to worship you. Daniel was the key. Father, I thank you because even through the difficulty of Daniel, he remained unchanged. My prayer, Lord, is that you will give us the same grace or even better grace. And I think you did. The grace that you gave to Daniel, same grace that you give to us so that we can remain pure, believers of you, humble, tactful, and resolve not to defy ourselves with everything that may ruin us in this pandemic. Give us the grace to live through this. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good day.